Yeah. yeah. Picture. Exactly. Opening people's imagination. Exactly. Okay. Um, why don't we get get started? Uh, super stimulating day today. Just a wonderful day and. Uh, Great science, great collegial interactions, everything we hope, have hoped for. And in the continuation of everything that we have hoped for, uh, um, it's great to have uh, uh, Tomas Lequi here, who uh, braved um, uh, delayed flights uh, from six hour delayed flight uh, from France, uh, but just showing how dedicated he is to. Um, uh, 4D cellular physiology, he um, hung in there and uh, made it to Janelia. And uh, thank you for coming here. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for staying awake. It's 2 a.m. It's, it's a pretty nice time to give a talk. Anyways, so give me the energy. I do have the energy. It's been a... So uh, it has been an overwhelming day and so many interesting things. We've heard so many interesting discussions. So I would like to entertain you with a topic uh, which we are very uh, fond of, which is the problem of morphogenesis. And as you will see, uh, the title of my talk is an invitation to think about information. And so uh, I would like to start with something which is um, uh, Bring, bringing us back 3.5 billion years ago, when the first bacteria, as we know them from fossils of stromatolites on the left here, this is a very old fossil of bacteria. These are today's uh, stromatolites. And if you look at what happens in those, it would be something like we've seen already, you know, bacteria dividing. And you know, we should not take for granted that any cell division is just an amazing phenomenon of transmission of not just DNA, but all that is required to actually perpetuate the organization of a cell. And uh, I would like to use that as a starting point to think about the problem of information. And so really the question we ask is how is cellular organization transmitted from one cell to another? It's a kid's question, but it's a question that I think we should all ask ourselves. And so indeed you could look at an E. coli cell in many ways. You could look at the composition, fairly complex. You could look at the structure, it's a simplistic view. You know, it's extremely complex cell. And so the, I would like to uh, propose you a thought experiment. Um, you grind it to a smoothie, you know, E. coli. Uh, you break down all structures that exist, but we leave behind DNA and even RNAs. So all the rest is there. There's nothing missing. The whole list part of an E. coli cells are there. And we ask with the best microscopes ever here at Genelia, are we going to see life restarting anew or not? And so Jennifer and probably all of you well already know the answer, although we cannot do the experiment probably because we need detergents that we can't get rid of when we do this experiment. So cells will not reform. So all the chemistry is there. There's just nothing missing. So what is missing? What's the missing information in a way? And that missing information is what it takes to actually even form a membrane efficiently, organelles, uh, there's no organelles in, in, a, in an E. coli, but you could do the same experiment with any cell type that you wish. And so in a way, uh, this is my way of introducing the concept of a missing information, which is not reduced to chemistry properly, but rather the structures that they form. And so really um, in the cell, what was missing is the inheritance, a geometric or structural inheritance, which is that double membrane of the cell. And if you did it in an E. coli, in a eukaryotic cell, that would be also maybe probably the organelles. And so we should not underappreciate the importance of this, type of this kind of inheritance. And that's the purpose of this introduction, to really bring the picture of the information that is required for the transmission of life now in eukaryotic cells with sexual reproduction when you have an egg, whether it be in a Drosophila embryo, as you see it here, we'll come back to that, or any like us. You know, we start from an, a cell that not just has a genome, um, a certain complex biochemistry, but also mechanics. That is definitely important to uh, produce a cell, organize it. But what is also important is this sort of third module of information, which I would refer to as geometric information. 
it's a means, it's a very generic term to refer to these structures that arise, are transmitted, and are not purely self-organized. Because, you know, in a way, the E. coli cell is not a purely self-organized system. So self-organization is used a lot. A self-organized system, in the strict definition, would be a system where the chemistry is enough to reconstitute anything. And life is not like that. There is some self-organized features, which we come back to, but life is not self-organized. It requires inheritance of information, which has two characters, one of which is genes and chemistry, and the other is precisely structures and geometry, which is the point that I was trying to make up to now. And that is going to be uh, one of the themes of my talk. So bear in mind now that we'll have three modules of information to think about. The very familiar green boxes, genetics and biochemistry, mechanics, which emerge from it but has some distinct features, and geometry. And so really, in thinking about that and having that in mind, you could think of not only the inheritance of information, so essential, but also the novel kind of information that arises from the interactions among these three modules. For instance, geometry is a consequence of mechanics or biomechanics. So geometry is updated at any moment and starts as new starting conditions to actually modify the way chemistry and mechanics play their games in space and time. And so really, these recursive interactions really allow, endow this system with amazing creative power. And that is what we would like to understand and what I would like to entertain you um, with tonight. And so now, having that in mind, and uh, Amy already introduced that, there's two ways to think about information flow. One is, a, in a caricature view, a top-down deterministic hierarchical system of information flow, where, for instance, you would start with biochemistry and geometry, and that would predict mechanical features, which will pre uh, predict shape. Indeed, and this is a, a one slide summarizing the works of many groups over many decades, there's a way to understand how positional information that Hanan actually introduced to us in great detail before actually controls cortical mechanics, in particular the pattern of adhesion, but also of contractility that exists in cells. And those spatial temporal patterns of cortical mechanics predict cell behavior and tissue morphogenesis, two examples being tissue invagination or tissue extension. So you could really go from this type of information hierarchically all the way down to tissue uh, shape changes. Uh, that would be an illustration of what I would call a program. But now there's another way, of course, to organize the information flow. One is that it's typically self-organized. You don't start with anything else than a homogeneous state of chemistry and uh, mechanics. And here, complex patterns emerge from the interactions among these uh, uh, components. You have a lot of stochasticity and many feedbacks, and complex patterns emerge. A simple example would be Turing instabilities. And there are many other manifestations, such as the one that Amy told us about, mechanochemical Turing-like instabilities or even the more complex termite mounds. So we pretend that there is no system in biology, whether at the cellular or organism scale, that is strictly self-organized, for the reasons that I just mentioned in my introduction before, or that is strictly program, uh, viewed as a program. It's always going to be a combination of these two views, and that is precisely what we're interested in in my group, is trying to interrogate any system and see what are the deterministic program features of information flow, and those that actually uh, uh, use the power of self-organization. And I finish with that at the end of my talk. And so we'll have to tell you two short stories, which both illustrate the importance of geometry, because that's the, sort of the aspect of information that we certainly have least appreciated, and probably others. And, and I will illustrate them in two contexts, one in which we discovered self-organization, and another one where it's actually more like a program deterministic uh, features. And I will start with self-organization. And so let's look at an embryo. This is actually a movie from Philip Keller, a Genelia, which I don't use it just because I'm Genelia. I just, it's a great movie, but I'm happy to show it again. Uh, and so in this movie, which show the movement of many nuclei, you recognize that as soon as the embryo is born, it makes some very complex spatial temporal dynamics of cells. But I would like to go to a more uh, sort of uh, inside view of the process where actually we see the cells, like columnar epithelial cells, would actually give rise to a rotation toward the dorsal top interior right uh, aspect of the embryo. And so we'll look at what happens in these cells that actually explains this, um, uh, these movements. So this uh, was a collaboration between uh, Anais and Claudio, biologists and physicists. 
And uh, let's look at these embryos from the surface in the dorsal part of the embryo. And so what we see is cells labeled with cadherin that shows they are a perimeter. And in green, what you have is a labeling of myosin 2 GFP, the regulatory light chain, that just shows activity or activation of myosin 2. And you will see here a domain that is very well positioned by the positional information that Anand introduced, uh, introduced us to in a very, uh, very well-defined primordium. But following that, which is sort of a readout of positional information, you have a wave of contractility that sweeps linearly through the tissue, as you can see. Um, it goes, so let's loop it. Cells here that did not contract uh, that activate myosin 2, and as soon as they activate myosin 2, they're going to be engulfed into this expanding invagination. So um, we were puzzled by this dynamics, which has been um, not described before. And so we have a primordium and we have a propagation domain. This propagation domain has features of a linear progression of a wave of activation. And we used experiments to actually rule out two simple hypotheses. One, that it would be a wave of transcriptional activation. We can even inject alpha-manitin after the primordium is induced and the wave propagates while no transcription happens at all. It's not even a wave front of ligand diffusion. There's a ligand that is produced in the primordium and its diffusion doesn't follow the features that you expect of a, a diffusion front. And so we ended up with a proposal that something else would be uh, going on which would has a mechanical feature. And so here you see a higher resolution movie of this wave where you could see the contractility of the cells uh, happening. Uh, I will just go very superficially through the description but I want to go through the essence of what's happening. So let's look at these cells laterally. So now we, in a way, uh, flip 90 degrees of view, which allows us to appreciate the geometry. We have a curved epithelium layer. These are the nuclei. And this is uh, just painted in red, the vitellin membrane, which is like an envelope, an ECM envelope that surrounds the embryo, shown schematically here. And so here you have the vitellin space. These are the pole cells. And I just draw your attention to what happens in the box. These cells, which are initially you know, straight uh, column, will actually bend. Their uh, base moves faster than their top region. And the reason why they bend is because, as I'll show you later, the apical surface of the cell is going to stick to the vitellin membrane. They're going to adhere to it. And because you have a movement behind that actually compresses forward the tissue, they're going to have the head sticking to the lid. And so they're going to be bent. And so what really happens is that you have a compression. So let's look at the adhesion to the vitellin membrane. This is a view from the top. You see that the cells are sort of stick to the vitellin membrane and snap back after they detach. So it's, think of a tissue that is sort of, you know, it's a de-adhesion process. And you see sort of extreme examples of the front is sort of revealing this adhesion. But we studied it chemically. It's integrin-dependent adhesion to the vitellin membrane. But the point is really <coughs> looking at what happens in this box. And so here's sort of a cartoon model of what is happening. Let's start with, um, I'm going to describe to you a cycle, a mechanochemical cycle, which would begin, for instance, with the activation of contractility in this furrow, in this orange region. The cells activate mice into the high levels. And because of their contraction, they're going to compress the cytoplasm. It's going to move forward um, and forward as well as to the top. And so it's going to bring the cells against the lid, against the vitellin membrane. And there they're going to engage in adhesion with, uh, in an integral independent adhesion. And so we have a compression that follows from the contractility and then adhesion to the vitellin membrane. Then some process that involves mechanochemical activation via integrin of actomyosin, which I completely uh, skip over, is, is, um, is myosin 2 is induced. And then when myosin 2 is induced, it's going to be just sitting next door to the invagination. And the cells contract, there's going to be a tensile force that actually de adheres the whole tissue. The cell is going to be detached. The cells at the top that you saw in the previous movie, they were detaching because this whole tissue was actually pulling perpendicular to the uh, uh, to the surface to which they adhere. And so effectively, when these cells actually de-adhere, uh, they join the furrow, they're going to actually move the tissue forward because of the incompressibility of the cytoplasm. It has to move somewhere. It's going to move to the right. And so the whole cycle is basically shifted or translated to more interior region. So it's not just a wave of myosin into contraction. It's a wave of everything. It's a wave of adhesion. It's a wave of deformation. And this whole system is basically kept intact by a, a contractility of the cells. If you inject a rock inhibitor, the whole cycle is blocked within seconds. 
So um, this is again a summary of something we published a few years back, but I wanted to draw your attention to this positive feedback that involves contractility, tissue invagination, compression, integrin based adhesion, as well as a more short range um, negative feedback, which is uh, reflecting the fact that the invagination also detaches the, um, the cells from the vitellin membrane. So in a way, collectively, these cells have features that are quite reminiscent of single cell adhesion in the sense that you have an active process, you have an adhesion, the adhesion cycle with a length scale and a time scale. But here, this is really controlled in a way that is uh, collective uh, across many cells. And so this was a sort of a summary of the role of the uh, envitalin membrane, which is sort of encapsulating the whole embryo as a substrate, a mechanical substrate that is required for the activation of myosin 2, which is essential for the wave to propagate. So you remove this geometry boundary, you have no wave at all. It's not that we've done the experiment, but you could knock out integrins, and it has an equivalence, you know, where the, the vitelline membrane is no longer seen by the cells, and then no wave happens. But I, I would like to go to another aspect, a more uh, explicit statement of the role of geometry, which is not going to be about a wave, but about a flow. So in a way, we're going to go backward in time, a few minutes, and actually study the very first events whereby actually the tissue breaks symmetry and is going to move toward the dorsal region. So the very first minutes where actually the, the whole tissue moves here. So this is a work that is um, been done by uh, two postdocs, uh, Emily and Bandan, in collaboration with Matthias Merkel. And um, let's look at these cells, uh, at this movement. So in the first phase, we see tracking the movement of cell, there is a symmetric phase of flow, where actually the cells move toward this region in a clockwise manner, and there's an anti-clockwise flow in the reverse position here. Um, but later on, and this is the most striking feature, uh, there is an increase in the speed of the clockwise rotation here of a flow, and, and that actually uh, dies out. So if you integrate the velocity across uh, around the whole circumference of the embryo, it starts from being zero because this is a symmetric phase of flow, and then it increases and becomes uh, positive. So I will present two kinds of data. The spatial profile of velocity across the circumference of the whole embryo. These are spatial coordinates going from here all the way around. And this is now the V bar is the spatial average of this velocity, uh, which shows whether you have a, uh, a, a positive increase. So this is manifestation of the symmetry breaking. So um, we first uh, confirmed that this movement requires contractility. So first you can see myosin 2 uh, here uh, from the side in the ethical region of these cells. And uh, if we, and you can see it in the inverse uh, 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 gray values where you see in black actually myosin 2. So we could use a mutation for a G-alpha protein, which is essential for the activation of RogF2, which is then activating RogGTP. Um, and then myosin 2. So in this mutant, uh, apical myosin 2 is not activated uh, everywhere in the embryo, but in particular here. And, myosin, and, and as you see in orange, there is no uh, uh, symmetry breaking. There's no flow that emerges in these uh, embryos. I forgot to mention to you that we could use a number of genetic tricks to actually show that the information that is required for the flow is strictly present in the posterior part of the embryo. We could use various mutations that remove mesoderm invagination, ectoderm flow, and symmetry breaking happens. And so it really requires, it uses information that is present in this part of the embryo. And it definitely contains myosin 2. So myosin 2 is required, but it's also not sufficient to drive the flow. And the reason is well illustrated if you use first a, uh, a, a, the kind of a theoretical model that we use throughout in this study. And this model is basically a simple 1D uh, um, thin layer where you have an active fluid, which represents the active contribution of myosin 2. And that takes into consideration the tissue viscosity, the friction with the vitellin membrane, and, and of course, the myosin 2 uh, dependent contractility. Now, if you put this into equation, you have here the active contribution of tension, the frictional forces, which works as a uniform external force to the system in pink, and also the, visco the viscous uh, uh, force. And so, um, we could solve the velocity um, profiles using myosin 2 uh, intensities at the base of the cells or apical cells from the data. And uh, we only have three uh, free parameters, actually two if we'd use the ratio of two of them. And so we could easily get this, uh, 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 this velocity profile. So now what you could imagine 
seeing that you have symmetric force is that if you just have these ingredients, uh, you cannot have a symmetry breaking because you have it's totally symmetric. And so indeed, uh, if you look at B bar, you know, in the simulations, there's no way you can have a symmetry breaking. You have no flow because basically any point that is contracting is going to draw contraction flow symmetrically around it. And so you, if you sum up, uh, you cannot have any symmetry breaking. So we're missing something. And so the one thing that was missing, for instance, would be an external uh, force such as a higher friction or adhesion in, say, a point where we also know that there are integrins. So this very integrin that I showed has such a role later on in development, at the time when actually the symmetry breaking happens, is already present. Might it play a role in actually serving as an anchor point? This is a paper from uh, Pavel Tomanchak and Stefan Grill's lab that showed that in tribolium, such a point of integrin adhesion is used as a fixed point, as an anchor, so to say, to actually uh, create the flow because it's an external force that breaks the symmetry in the equations. And so indeed, when you do that, you nonetheless predict that the spatial profile of velocity would give rise to a zero velocity at the point of uh, high uh, friction. And uh, this is absolutely not what we see in the data. So the point is that an external friction cannot produce the kind of spatial profile of velocity in whichever condition you could consider. So there's no way from the model that you could actually get the flow. But we nonetheless did the experiment because we are experimentalists, and so we knocked out uh, uh, alpha integrin scab, and that actually has a complete normal symmetry breaking velocity. The flow emerges normally at the right time and the right speed. You only have problems later on due to the problem that I mentioned to you before, this wave of propagation that actually initiates around this time. And so we are now have ruled out the two simple models that we could have in mind. So we're missing something. What is again the missing information in the system? And so this missing information is typically a geometric information. And I'd like to finish with that. So let's consider, in a, in a way, the, uh, an aspect that arises from the existence of an apical and basal myosin II. See, if, if apical and basal myosin II are at similar level or exert similar forces, what you have are symmetric forces, and you basically have symmetric flow. That we talked about already. But now if you have um, an excess of myosin II at the apex compared to the basal surface, then you're going to exert an active moment that is going to exert torque on the neighboring cell, and that will lead to a reduction of the curvature of the tissue. And so in the context of the embryo, where actually the pressure in the yolk and the shape of the vitellin membrane uh, forces the tissue layer to have a um, positive curvature, what this uh, active moment will actually create is a, um, uh, will, will cause actually the system to flow so that they can reduce the curvature of this tissue patch. And so um, in particular in the drawing, you see that the zone of contraction is offset from the uh, center of symmetry of the embryo. I come back to that. And that's why it would flow in this direction and not in the other one, because if it wanted to go in the other direction, it would increase the curvature, okay? So the point is that the flow emerges as a uh, consequence of the inactive moments that want to reduce the curvature of the whole tissue. And so we added this term in the equation where we have an active moment. C is a curvature of the embryo. And so now you could yet again solve the velocity profile given myosin two intensities and you know, uh, doing the uh, parameter phasing procedure as we've done before. And it turns out that a priori, the two key features that are actually are the condition for flow to emerge are one, of course, the existence of a curvature profile, a gradient of curvature. And the other one is the existence of an offset between the curvature and the contractility gradients. The fact that it is not centered typically on the posterior of the embryo, but that myosin two contraction is slightly offset which you could see in this image and quantified here. In green, you have myosin to intensity, and in black, you have the curvature profile. We'll see there's a little bit of an offset. And so first, you can use simple uh, ellipsoid representation of the embryo to actually show that indeed, if you have no offset, you have no uh, symmetry breaking, uh, V bar is zero all the time. If how now you allow some offset to emerge, the more offset you have, the more symmetry breaking is happening, you, you know, the uh, velocity is actually increases over time. And the second aspect is that if you change the aspect ratio of the ellipse, which is a way to change the curvature gradient, then of course, if you have a sphere or a circle, you have no uh, symmetry breaking uh, because all points are equivalent. The, you will have a little invagination, but you will have no flow uh, because curvature is the same all around. But if you now have a, a more increased aspect ratio, then of course, you will have 
asymmetry breaking. Um, and so with that in mind, now we look for mutants that would actually change these two parameters. And we use first a mutant, FAT2, which is you make an embryo that is genetically completely wild type, but because of the genotype of the mother, it actually produces an egg that is uh, less elongated. The curvature profile is changed. And so uh, you can look at the aspect ratio, which is reduced, but most importantly, you can see that the velocity of the flow is reduced uh, compared to the wild type, which you predict from the fact that you have a, a reduced uh, curvature profile. We have not yet been able to produce a completely spherical egg. This is just something we try to do, where we predict actually zero flow at all. This is like sort of an intermediate step where you have a reduced curvature gradient compared to the wild type. Wild type. And the other mutant is equally interesting. It's one that actually uh, controls the offset because it's a mutant of TOR, which is a gene, path, a gene that controls a pathway that controls the DV polarity of the embryo and therefore the uh, dorsal offset of the mice into contraction. We don't understand the mechanism, but in the mutant, the offset is reduced and the velocity profile is actually reduced. Interestingly enough, because the effect of flow is to shift the domain of contraction, you predict that there will be an amplification of the offset as a result of flow. So there's a feedback in the system that explains why actually the velocity increases over time. So these kind of analysis confirm to us that the curvature profile is a key element that determines uh, the uh, emergence of flow. So to summarize, what actually accounts for the flow is the interaction between two inherited information from the mother. One, of course, is its genotype, and the, which translates into the pattern of mice in the contraction that is shifted toward the dorsal region. And second, the curvature profile, which is the shape of the egg molded by the mother in the egg chamber. And so to summarize, the tissue flow shows the existence of an heredity uh, that has two features, the mechanochemistry that emerges from the uh, genotypes and the, which manifests in the positional information. And the one is a structural heredity, the shape of the egg. And the tissue wave uh, manifests the role of uh, the geometry as a boundary condition that enables mechanochemical feedbacks that actually produces this wave of deformation through the whole embryo. And so as a final statement, I'm over, final slide. Um, in thinking about the usefulness of a program or in self-organization that are always mixed together in some ways, I'd like to propose that self-organization uh, because of the fact that it allows the expression of many states available to the system maybe what I call creativity at low cost. It doesn't take a lot to actually produce complex patterns. But now they may not be extremely canalized, they could be very exploratory, and maybe you need boundary conditions that are in a way canalized by sort of the inherited information. Typically the geometry would canalize the flow, for instance, uh, as well as orient it. And, and, and so this is more like food for thoughts, but I felt it would be interesting to maybe uh, discuss that. And I would like to thank my colleagues. Uh, I quoted them already, uh, these fantastic people, and I will take your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks for that great talk. Um, wow, a lot of questions. Well, let's start with Zach. Thanks, Tamar. That was super cool. Um, it's, I guess I, I had a question about the last slide, and yes. um, you know, it could be semantic, but you know, could it be that a you could have a self-organizing program, but highly constrained starting conditions and boundary conditions, and so it looks like a pro like a program. Yes, you know, it's very highly canonized. I, I think you're saying that indeed, and I totally agree with you that there is no system that is not going to have some elements of heredity that is going to canalize and program the system, as well as some elements of of, of self-organization. Mm -hmm. I think the purpose of my introduction was to to illustrate that in the most simple case ever, E. coli you require an information. Now, any other system will require even more uh, pre, you know, a template mm -hmm. to initiate the whole system. So I agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but also important to appreciate for those like me who are strained as developmental biologists that simply ignored the power of self-organization, that if you didn't have the power of, the exploratory power of self-organized system, those boundary conditions would be not enough to guide the system to where it goes. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, it's a perspective where you, I think, that's why I'd like to think of those as maybe canalizing or endowing robustness and the other way. So you need both, effectively. Right. So, and the other thing I would like to say is that often in development, the output of a system would be a new starting condition for the next phase. And so for that reason, um, you know, the self-organization is used as another uh, boundary condition or initial condition for the rest. Yeah.
Yes, um, <clears throat> you mentioned my myosin is important for this bending of the cells, right? Um, what about nuclear positioning? Because hmm. I noticed that some cells close to where it's b things are bending are moving and the cells are getting polarized. If this is necessary for the bending to occur? Like so you're, you're asking whether the, the movement, the position and movement of nuclei, which we see here in, in black, yeah, the Whether ones that are outside the box that are entering, they're actually moving like to the other side. Yeah. I wonder if, if the link complex, I mean, all these cells might be yes. talking to each other through the cytoskeleton and they're right. actually deciding, okay, let's move these nuclei away so this part of the membrane is more right. bendy so things can kind of bend so that it's way. A, it's a good observation. We actually, although we did publish a paper on nuclear envelope you know, mechanics, and we appreciate its importance. We've never studied it in the context of morphogenesis. And so I don't know where, to what extent, I mean, I, I used to think it was a passive response to some other mechanical features. I actually line with your intuition that it might be actually actively controlled, but uh, we don't know. Okay. You know, um, um, there was someone in, in uh, Eric Wisher's lab who suggests uh, that actually the uh, nuclei may, actually, its movement will actually be like a piston in a cell, and so, how organelles and other things may be affected by that. It's also important to know that the cells are not sealed at the bottom. And so that allows me to introduce with the question that there's fluid here, there's fluid here, there's fluid here. The extent to which these three fluids communicate with one another to allow the invagination to occur is interesting because if you create a deep invagination, the whole fluid is moved here and it would run out of fluid here. So we want to investigate whether there is some adaptation of the whole fluid by through this, which was not your question, but it was a, a train in that. Sorry. Thank you. <coughs> That's really beautiful. Um, I have two questions. One is about the, you know, like you, you mentioned this active component of the curvature. Uh, I can see that, you know, once you start, it explains which way it goes. Yes. But I still don't understand like how it initiates. Maybe I'm missing something. Oh, it initiates because you have this offset. So actually you see it very well in simulations. If you have, well, first we know that in a dorsal mutant, in an embryo where there's absolutely no offset at all, there's no symmetry breaking at all. In a tall, it's, it's interesting. And I only told you part of the story. It, when it goes dorsal, it goes, with a reduced velocity, but in fact, it goes randomly. It could be lateral flow. And our hypothesis, because I've described and we model it as a 1D structure, because we cut through, but in fact, it's a 3D, it's a 2D surface embedded in 3D. And in the mutant, it goes on the right, on the left, even ventrally. We think the reason is because the patch of myosin too is, you know, has some, because of the patterning defects in toll, has some kind of irregular shape and gives some stochasticity as to where the most contraction is there, given the, pro the profile of curvature. And so it could go into any direction depending on the random uh, shape of myosin too. So, yeah. That's cool. So uh, another question is a smaller one. It's like, you know, what are those cells protruding out? I see Pulled in some cells. of your movies, like the cells in the Pulled upper cells. left corner. Sorry. Pulled cells. The pole cells, the precursor of the germline. Oh, the precursor. And you can get rid of them and it's the system goes normally. They are also transported by the tissue flow. So that was related to my question. So if you get rid of those pole cells, you still see the same behavior? Yeah. So what's creating that vitellin space? How is that? Where's the material? Yeah, the vitellin space is not created by the pole cells pushing out. It's, but it's, are they secreting anything? So I actually don't know. So the vitellin membrane, so in the egg, so let's yeah. go now a few hours back in the, yeah. in the, in the egg chamber. So surrounding the egg, you yeah. have this follicular epithelial layer, and this follicular epithelial layer is the what that makes the vitellin membrane, the chorion that we removed in our experiment that is normally present outside, and uh, also makes some important signaling to the, uh, the whole embryo, like polarity, DV polarity comes from the follicular epithelium. Yeah. I would guess that the vitellin space, vitellin fluid, is also made by the secretion of the follicle cells, but yeah. honestly, I don't know much. We tried to work yeah. actually on the composition, composition of the vitellin membrane. It contains you know, probably some collagen, but not sure. Other components, we, 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 we want to investigate the structure, composition of all of that. So I guess one, one question I have is, so that invagination is playing a critical role in isolating the germ cells. Yes. 
I mean, that's the most important thing. Yes. For well, this whole it's organism. It's if you're going to propagate, you isolate these germ cells. So why those, I mean, what's the mechanism of getting those germ cells there? I mean, is this cause, I mean, are the germ cells in some way help, you know, choosing where this is happening? Mm. I don't so, think so they they yeah. are formed by you know it's a syncytial embryo yeah and the first cells to actually bud out of the yeah. cortex are the pulse cells exactly okay and they have some special cytoplasm that yeah. actually silence transcription you know they have some interesting yeah. you know nuclear features uh, and they are set aside and they will be sitting on top of the other cells that form later on during cellularization and they are just passively transported and they're active they are passive objects transported by the active motion that I described. But that's a really important. Of course. That has to be a conserved evolutionary yes. process, yes. or else you don't get. If you're germline. sterile, you're you don't dead. get anything yeah. happening to this yes, fly. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for a very stimulating talk. Um, and our last talk for the evening is uh, Jared Rudder, and he'll bring us from. Uh, mechanics back to metabolism. Thanks, Ron. And thanks to uh, Ron and Jennifer for the invitation to be here. It's a really fun meeting. I love these kind of meetings where the, okay. is it not on? Want your Should I yell? <laughs> we can hear you pretty well. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I tend audience. to not be <laughs> accused of being yeah. too quiet very often. <laughs> Make a bill will text it. It's five in the morning for you. There we go. It's getting late for all of us. Um, I, I love these kind of meetings. Thanks, Ron and Jennifer, for the chance to be here, where it's broad, the, the, the topics are broad, and really causes us all to think outside of what we normally think about. It does create a challenge for people like me, though, because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about metabolism. And I am completely aware that at least 50% of you think metabolism is really boring. And, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to try and talk you out of that. I hope we can agree, though, that even if it's boring, metabolism is important. Because all the cool stuff that you guys study all depends on the energy that is generated by metabolism and the, the building blocks that um, come from metabolism. And so I, I hope we can settle on that. And I think... We talked about, you know, Mung talked about great examples of metabolite, uh, metabolism doing more than just building stuff. Some metabolites actually signal and, and make behavioral effects on cells. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So um, I'm going to, I know it's late, and I was about to complain about how late it is, and then Tomas is, you know, it's at 2 a.m. Tomas's time, so that seems lame of me to complain about how late it is. Um, but I'm going to keep this pretty conceptual and, and high level. I promise to not show you too many metabolic pathways. So when I, I'm old enough and have been interested in metabolism enough that I first started attending meetings that were metabolism-ish, um, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. And when you'd go to those meetings, there would often be a session on transcription of 
genes that encode metabolic enzymes. There would be a session on development of tissues that regulate metabolism, like the pancreas or adipose tissue. There would be sessions on kinase signaling pathways that control metabolism, like the insulin signaling pathway and things like that. What there would almost never be is a session on metabolism, um, like what metabolites are actually doing and the interconversions that are happening. It just didn't happen. There would sometimes be like one token talk by some person who was almost always very, very old and um, tired and beaten down um, that would give a talk about metabolism. And, you know, it was always interesting. You know, you'd see the students in the back that were snickering and thinking how quaint it is that people used to work on stuff like this, like metabolism, um, you know. Uh, and, but the good news is that in the last five to 10 years, there's been a revolution. And some of those snickering graduate students now run labs that work on metabolism <laughs> and, um, and are doing really cool stuff. And we now have this problem of this field of built on classical biochemistry that is now living in a world with new school technologies that we've heard a ton about. And I think um, the challenge now that I think is an enormous challenge is to integrate that. Integrate the biochemistry and you know the analytical chemistry and, and, and protein biochemistry that's been done in the past with the technologies that have amazing uh, uh, resolution capacity that you know, again, we've heard all, all about. And I think this is an enormous opportunity for 4D cellular physiology. So I told, it, told you about how the field of metabolism forgot about the metabolites for 30 years, and, and now they're coming back. So when I think about when I was invited to come to this meeting and, and, and talk about what I think about um, the field, I thought about what do we need to know to really understand metabolism? You know, not the peripheral things related to metabolism, but metabolism, the metabolites. What do we need to know? And I think the key thing that, that is obviously a part of this 4D cellular physiology is to understand this in vivo. And I think we need to understand the chemical reactions to what are metabolites converted and at what rate. And um, we need to know where metabolites are. And I'll talk about uh, uh, this a little bit more. And what do metabolites do? So I'll go through each one of these and just say something about it. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the chemical reactions that happen in metabolism. I think we are, uh, we've seen a, this is probably the one area of metabolism that has evolved the most in the last decade or so. We now have really powerful tools to quantitatively measure where an atom from one metabolite goes in terms of its presence in other metabolites at, and, and the rates behind that. And we're, uh, there's continuous development of that technology, of the mass spectrometry-based technology to do this with you know, isotope-labeled molecules, conceptual advances that are driving better experiments and the computational tools to model this uh, more effectively. And I think this, uh, this also requires more physiological systems in which to deploy this technology and, a, and, and especially to do this in vivo and even in humans. And again, this now happens. I would say it's still a frontier technology to do this in human patients, to measure, actually measure metabolism and metabolic rates in humans. Um, uh, it happens, but I would say it's still at the frontier of the field. I would say, interestingly, we've heard a lot of talks about the brain. It's my uh, impression that this is maybe the one tissue in the body where we know the least about actual metabolic rates and metabolic fluxes, and I think it's a huge opportunity to, to better understand that. So I think we need to know where metabolites are. You know, it goes without saying that when we measure metabolism, 
most often what we do when we're measuring, you know, trying to measure metabolism in a creature like a mouse is we whack out the liver, grind it up, and measure metabolites. And we lose all of the information about where those metabolites are within the liver. And maybe we'll take one lobe or another lobe or whatever. But we lose all the information about which cells those metabolites are in and at what concentration. Um, and uh, I think you know, Jennifer told, gave us examples of this, how a metabolite in one cell at a given concentration means something totally different than that metabolite in, in a different cell. And um, uh, you know, that's, that's an enormously important parameter, where metabolites are. And you know, uh, 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 Vamsi talked about um, the development of, of imaging-based uh, metabolomics. But even that, as of today, is not high enough resolution to see it, specific cells that metabolites are in. And, and I think this is an area of technology development where we we really need advances. In my opinion, this may be one of the most important limitations that our field faces. You know, uh, uh, the ability to understand in which cells metabolites are. And that is even the simpler problem because, you know, I will give you, show you an example a little bit later and, and I think you all recognize, and again, Bumps, you talked about this in the context of NADH. Metabolites in one place in a cell mean something very different than another place in the cell. In the mitochondria versus the cytosol, for example, the concentration of NADH is very different and means something very different in different places. And uh, we just right now don't have great abilities to do that. I, I talked to uh, Tim and Johnny at the poster session at Janelia about developing biosensors. I think this is one of the key developments that, that could really transform our ability to understand um, with spatial resolution um, the uh, location of metabolites. So I will talk to you a little bit about that later, about metabolite compartmentalization. And that will lead into a, a, a brief discussion about the functions of metabolites, specifically the importance of metabolites as signaling molecules and the language that our cells use to communicate metabolic information um, to affect cell behaviors. Um, and I will then talk about why this is a difficult challenge technologically, and I'll describe one approach that we're using to try to deal with that. So um, buckle up. This is the, the one metabolism slide that I will show you, I think, and it's not too bad, hopefully. This is going to introduce what I'm going to tell you about metabolite compartmentalization and, and sort of kick us off. So, I think we all know that when glucose is brought into the cell, the majority of that glucose is converted to pyruvate in the cytosol. And in most cells in our body, the majority of that pyruvate is taken into mitochondria where it's oxidatively decarboxylated to acetyl-CoA, which then donates its carbons to the TCA cycle where they are oxidized. And this enables highly efficient ATP production. This is the way that a lot of the, the ATP that's generated in our body is generated. is through this um, uh, metabolism of carbohydrates. Some cells, however, don't do this as, uh, as actively and instead convert pyruvate or other glycolytic intermediates into building blocks that fuel cell growth and proliferation. And so this is most commonly observed or most commonly thought about in the context of cancer where this phenomenon is known as the Warburg effect, that, that cells tend not, cancer cells tend not to oxidize their pyruvate, but instead do other things with it. This is well known to occur, again, in cancer cells. It's observed in some, in some stem cell populations, in activated immune cells, and in other normal and disease settings, some of which I'll, I'll talk about later. So, Arguably, this might be the most well-understood, well-studied well metabolic pathway in all of biology. But surprisingly, one component of this pathway was not identified until relatively recently, and that is the means whereby pyruvate, which is a charged molecule, it can't pass through membranes on its own, whereby this molecule gets into the mitochondrial matrix where it can encounter the enzymes that will decarboxylate it. So we found, along with the lab of Jean-Claude Martineau, uh, 
um, several years ago now, the protein complex known as the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier that is necessary and sufficient for mitochondrial pyruvate uptake. And um, that was cool. We were excited to place this dimeric protein complex in this pathway. It's great. But by far, the most impactful outcome of that discovery was that it enabled us to start asking questions about what function this complex has, and thereby what function pyruvate being here versus here has on cell biology. Does it matter whether cells do the Warburg effect, like I was describing, or oxidize their pyruvate like, you know, again, like most normal cells do? Does that actually matter for cell biology? And so the question, specific question is, is it possible that loss of this um, uh, mitochondrial pyruvate carrier might underlie um, the, the metabolic program that occurs in cancer cells? And indeed, we found that low MPC activity is necessary for tumor formation, at least in, in some uh, uh, forms of cancer, like colorectal cancer, for example, Low MPC activity is necessary for tumor initiation and is at least to some extent sufficient to, to predispose for tumor form formation. And this is probably derivative of the fact that low MPC activity is also necessary and sufficient for stem cell homeostasis. Again, we've studied this most in the context of, of intestinal stem cells. And I just want to show you a few of the experiments that have led us to that conclusion about the importance of this protein and thereby the location of pyruvate for um, um, determining the fate of stem cells. And the first experiment I'll show you uses the uh, in, um, in vitro culture of intestinal organoids. So what you're looking at is two microscopic images of intestinal organoids, which is basically an intestinal epithelium that's enclosed, where you see these um, uh, uh, um, protrusions that are created by the proliferation and differentiation of stem cells that sit at the base of these structures that are the equivalent of what would be intestinal crypts in the in vivo situation. And again, these are driven by the proliferation and differentiation of stem cells. So these cells, as I described, have low expression of the MPC. They do the Warburg effect, so to speak. And that changes as they differentiate. They then be, induce the expression of the MPC and become more uh, 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 oxidative in terms of their metabolism of carbohydrates. So if we form organoids and then ectopically force these stem cells to prematurely turn on the expression of the MPC to change their metabolism from one that's not like a stem cell but more like a differentiated cell, what happens? And what we found is that they, those cells essentially lose the ability to act like stem cells. And as a result, you see the morphological phenotype, which is you don't form crypts. But molecularly, these cells lose the expression of stem cell marker. They essentially stop being stem cells when you change their metabolism to be the metabolism of a differentiated cell. And this phenotype is completely reversed by treatment of, of this in vitro culture with an inhibitor of the MPC. So we then did the, the uh, and I should say, this is in spite of the fact that the medium here has went and arspondin and noggin constitutively telling these cells to be stem cells. It just doesn't matter if the metabolism doesn't cooperate. So we then did the converse experiment to isolate wild-type stem cells from a, from a culture like this one and replate them and ask for their ability to make a new organoid, a classic stem cell uh, assay. And what we found is that they would make an organoid at 10% you know, frequency or whatever, and treatment of these cultures with an MPC inhibitor, and this is wild-type stem cells now, was sufficient to rather dramatically increase their propensity to make a new organoid. It made them better stem cells to a similar, even greater degree than the classic stem cell-inducing uh, 
uh, treatments, valproic acid and GSK3 beta, which the latter of which works really effectively to make stem cells be better by enforcing, making, making the Wnt beta catenin pathway constitutively active. That can be mimicked just by manipulating the metabolism. So um, I finally want to show you one experiment using Drosophila intestinal stem cells, which my lab didn't do. It was done by a collaborator, the lab of Carl Thummel at the University of Utah. And this system allows one to do a very powerful experiment to examine the cell autonomy of this phenomenon in vivo in a, in a living organism using clonal analysis. So what you're looking at here is um, the fly intestinal epithelium where in a single cell was induced to express GFP and simultaneous to that underwent a genetic manipulation, either a controlled genetic manipulation here or in this case to um, eliminate the expression of the APC tumor suppressor, which again causes constitutive activation of the Wnt beta catenin pathway in that cell and then all of its progeny, which are also marked with GFP. And in flies, there happens to be two APC genes, which is why there's two. But what you can see here is that, not surprisingly, when you eliminate that tumor suppressor gene, that cell and its progeny hyperproliferate, and you get a bigger clone, which is you know, quantified here. Not surprising. I should say, when that happens, these APC-deficient cells are MPC-low. They are stem cells, they're hyperproliferative, and they have low expression of the MPC. They are presumably, although this hasn't been measured, given the challenges I was just describing, um, they are MPC low and probably doing the Warburg effect like metabolism. So what happens then if in these two situations, we basically prevent these stem cells from having low MPC expression? We force them to express a more differentiated-like um, uh, metabolic program. What happens is you basically, from the time that is induced, these cells stop proliferating. And again, lose the expression of stem cell markers. It's important to note, these cells don't die. The number of clones is the same. They just stop proliferating, lose the expression of, of stem cell markers, and essentially stop being stem cells. And again, in this case, this is in spite of the fact that the signaling is telling these cells to be stem cells and to proliferate. To proliferate. The Wnt beta catenin pathway is fully on telling them to behave a certain way, but when the metabolism isn't um, behaving as, as they, they want, it doesn't work. So we and others have published that there are similar effects in mice and in fish, and our collaborators and colleagues at UCLA, the lab of Heather Kristoff and Bill Lowry, have shown that very similar things happen in hair follicle stem cells. Um, so this seems to be a general phenomenon of the importance of metabolism in, um, in the fate of stem cells. So what I've told you, just to summarize, is that low MPC activity seems to drive these behaviors that are, um, uh, um, that are consistent with cell proliferation, biomass production. And this is happening, th this metabolic state is causing these cells to change their fate, to change their gene expression program to behave in a certain way. And I need to emphasize, it's not like these cells, you know, if, if the MPC is lost, or, or overexpressed, uh, for example, it's not like they try to proliferate and fail and die through some crisis. They just change their fate and behave differently. There's some kind of signaling going on here. So we first made these observations, uh, you know, a number of years ago now. And being trained as a biochemist and, you know, priding myself, I would say, on trying to understand the things we, we work on mechanistically, um, it's very important for my psyche that we try and understand the molecular mechanisms underlying this. And we, we've assumed, I, I think it's evident, 
that there must be a metabolite somewhere. I'm depicting it as a yellow star here, not necessarily in the mitochondria as I've shown here, but somewhere, that is responsive directly or indirectly to the activity of the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier. And we presume that it must somehow interact with a protein and then directly or indirectly change the gene expression program. That's kind of what I've shown you, is that we manipulate metabolism, we get a different gene expression program, and I can't think of any way for that to work other than something like this. And we have essentially completely failed to figure out how this works in our case. What is this yellow star? What are the protein to which it, protein or proteins to which it, it interacts? And, and, and how does this signal to change the gene expression program? And it's not just us. There are hundreds of examples in the literature of cases where metabolism or metabolites do something. And very rarely do we really know with molecular resolution how that happens. What are the, the, the specific sensors and transducers of that signal? So why is this so hard? And it, and it is hard. I think the problem starts right at the very beginning. We are just simply not very good at discovering and studying metabolite protein interactions, frankly, as a scientific community. And especially when you compare that with our ability to study protein-protein interactions, for which we have fantastic databases that we all go and look at and teach us a lot about what proteins do and protein DNA interactions, and protein RNA interactions. Again, where we have enormously powerful proteome and genome-wide and transcriptome-wide data sets for these kinds of interaction uh, domains. We just don't have this kind of systematic, generalizable approach for um, uh, protein metabolite interactions. And I've come to believe that this is, again, a profound limitation for our field. And so we decided a few years back that we would make it a, a goal to try to fill this gap, to systematically discover these metabolite protein interactions. And we're taking multiple approaches to this. And I'm going to tell you only about one today, um, very quickly. So this is a, a, a platform that we call MIDAS that was developed by Kevin Hicks, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab. Very, very simple technology whereby we separate a protein of interest from a pool of metabolites that's uh, defined across a dialysis membrane. This system is allowed to come to equilibrium, whereby the free concentration of metabolites becomes the same on both sides of the membrane. But any metabolite that directly interacts or physically interacts with a protein becomes then enriched in terms of total concentration here compared to here. We just then have to eliminate the protein, quantify the metabolites on both sides, and we're left with situations like the one in purple here, where um, you know, this purple metabolite putatively directly interacts with that protein of interest. So Kevin developed this. Of course, we wanted to, to pilot it on proteins that have known metabolite interactions. There are great examples in the mTORC1 signaling pathway, those shown in red here. Um, uh, we acquired these proteins, analyzed them for, uh, through MIDAS, and found with very high selectivity and sensitivity um, the known metabolite interactions. So bolstered by that confidence now, in the last couple of years, we've now um, run hundreds of proteins through the MIDAS platform. And that data is depicted here in heat map form with metabolites along the top, proteins along the side, and each intersection point is the enrichment of that metabolite in the presence of that protein, you know, um, like I described on the, uh, on the previous slide. And so if you zoom in, you will see cases like this one shown here, where this is a high positive value, where this metabolite was enriched in the presence of that protein, suggestive of a direct physical interaction. And this happens to be the arginine interaction with castor, which is an mTORC1 regulator that I showed on the previous slide. 
So where are we um, now? We've analyzed, this is a little bit old, 220 proteins through the Midas platform. They've mostly been metabolic enzymes, which um, has a historical reason. We've found over 3,400 statistically significant interactions, the vast majority of which were previously unknown. We've taken 100 of those previously unknown interactions and asked the question whether that metabolite influences the in vitro measurable activity of the protein to which it binds, and found that in 70% of the cases it does, including many, uh, maybe 25%, that actually stimulate enzyme activity, which we think is interesting. And with collaborators, we now have 12 atomic resolution structures of those novel metabolite interactions. And just in the last, last slide I will show you, um, I uh, will give you a flavor of some of those structures. So we recently found using MIDAS and published with collaborators at Calico Labs that the EIF2B translation initiation factor, which many of you will recognize as the target of the memory-enhancing ISRIB uh, drug that Peter Walter's lab described, interacts with sugar phosphates, like fructo fructose 6-phosphate. And these sugar phosphates stabilize and activate this decameric form of EIF2B, and there's some really interesting biology and biochemistry here that I, I, I won't take the time to tell you about. These are three other MIDAS-discovered metabolite protein interactions that are each interesting for their own reasons. Um, but again, uh, we're out of time, and I won't tell you anything about them. And I knew I was going to be too verbose. I should have just taken these slides out. Um, I was going to give you one sort of vignette of, of something that we found, but I'll skip to the end and just tell you. I've talked about the importance of where metabolites are. Pyruvate in the mitochondria means something very, very different for cells than pyruvate in the cytosol. And I hope I've convinced you of that by... Uh, you, by manipulation of the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier. And I think it's really important for us to be able to measure that, to be, not only be able to manipulate it like we've done, but to be able to measure it. And, to, um, and I think the development of technologies to do that is, is incredibly important for our understanding of cellular physiology. I've also talked about the language uh, by which uh, metabolites communicate to control cellular physiology. And I believe that the vocabulary of that language are the individual metabolite macromolecule interactions that, that, um, that I've been talking about. And the grammar of that language, I think we can then start to understand how those interactions work together to um, control cell behaviors and cellular physiology. And I think those interactions will not just be metabolites interacting with metabolic enzymes. They will be metabolites interacting with transcription factors and kinases and G proteins and, cell and, and membrane trafficking proteins and, and all the other interesting kinds of proteins that you all work on. And, and it's really a goal of ours. I think it's profoundly important for us to discover these interactions and then try and understand how they work together to control cell behaviors. So these are the people that did the work that I described. The MPC work was done by these people in my lab and, and uh, uh, Carl Thummel in his lab. And the MIDAS work that I described was done by these folks. So thanks to them, thanks to you, thanks to HHMI for helping to pay for this. And, and uh, I'll take any questions you might have this late hour. Thank you, Jared. Um, maybe I'll just ask you a question. You know, since we, there's this entire pharmaceutical industry that is working on small molecule protein uh, docking computationally, and you have a sea of metabolites, which are basically small molecules, mm -hmm. is there any way to bootstrap on all of that effort, you know, not to necessarily go through the whole protein production, but at least get a as a first start, of a screen of a docking map of what docking sites there may be between metabolites and transcription factors and kinases. It's a great idea, and I think um, you know I I would I think right now we are not very good at predicting small molecule binding sites on proteins. You know it happens all the time that you know a company or an academic will do a drug screen and they'll find a molecule. 
that binds to some place on a protein that has no business binding a small molecule, but it will turn out to be a highly effective molecule at activating or inhibiting the protein. And so I think that what you say is completely true, and I think is, is I would say, maybe a next frontier in our ability to understand these and these interactions as well as drug interactions is by being able to predict them. Um, and I'm hoping that if we get enough examples that we will then maybe learn the rules a little bit more and be able to be better at predicting where metabolites interact. As you know, there's a lot of dynamism in the, in the, in the uh, cracks and crevices of proteins that can, can bind small molecules. These interactions are often also low affinity. You know, there's not off, there, there's many times not this really well-defined, you know, hole in a protein where a metabolite will sit. It's a little uh, crack on the surface or crevice on the surface. So it's a great question. Okay, wow, a lot of, okay. Uh, Jifu, why don't you go ahead and... Uh... Fantastic talk. So, so oh, the uh, Midas methodology is very interesting. And based on your matrix that data, seems that there are some lines, like either vertical or horizontal. Are those like either the metabolite or the proteins? They are sticky? Like, do you would like to bind it to many things? Or what's your thought? Yeah, no, it's a great question and perceptive question. Um, there are definitely metabolites that interact with a lot of proteins. So the, the most prominent vertical lines, the most prominent metabolites that interact with a lot of proteins are NAD and NADH, which is probably biological, right? There are a lot of dehydrogenases in our data set that bind and use NAD and NADH. So I would say on the metabolite side, I think a lot of what we see is biologically relevant. We've done a lot of data processing to try and eliminate noise. And so I think a lot of that is real. On the protein side, you know, proteins are pretty heterogeneous, and there are definitely some that are stickier and crappier than others. So I, I, I'm less confident that, that all of that is real. But I think on the metabolite side, there are, there are heavy hitters, and there are others that aren't. A quick question following up that. Uh, so what if a protein can actually convert, like an enzyme can convert a metabolite? Then yeah. in that case, have you seen that both sides the, the, in the mass spec, it goes down-regulated? Fantastic question. Yeah, so we, we had this vision. We got KRAS, and we were going to find an allosteric regulator of KRAS that prior to a couple of years ago was going to be the drug that was going to inhibit. We'd find an allosteric site that would be a perfect way to target KRAS. What we found was not that. We found that KRAS enriched GDP, the product of KRAS, which binds to it, and it depleted GTP. So GTP was actually depleted from that protein-containing chamber. So what we're seeing there is that KRAS is a GTPase, and it hydrolyzes GTP, converts it to GDP. And we've seen that a lot. So we can actually see chemistry happening. We've actually um, I think have putative um, enzyme activities for a, a number of, of um, enzymes that we've analyzed through Midas. Okay, I think we're just going to take two more questions, and then we can continue informally. Please go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, I have. Uh, I found that you uh, overexpressed the uh, MCP and uh, PC, sorry, uh, in the Drosophila embryo, and it inhibits the cell from uh, like division. And did you ever try to like knock down the MPC in like post mitotic cells to make it? Will it divide? I I'm just curious. Fantastic question. Um, I took those slides out, but we asked exactly that question. So if you induce a biosynthetic metabolic program that's normally happening in a mitotic cell, one that's dividing. What happens? So we did that in cardiomyocytes that are post-mitotic. And what you observe is that those cells get bigger. They build metabolites, and they do protein synthesis, but they don't divide, and those cells get bigger. And there's there's, you know, we've, we've published a couple of papers on this. Other labs have published papers on this. And as a result of that, that's actually quite important pathologically for cardiomyopathies, that these cells, that cardiomyocytes get bigger. So at least in that setting, it's sufficient to cause them to increase in biomass. 
Not, no. It's a, so cardiomyocytes are already polyploid. So we haven't seen a change in ploidy, um, but they do get bigger. And it, it's an interesting question. We don't really understand. You know, it's not obvious to me that if a cell has more amino acids, it therefore will make more protein, right? That's not intrinsically obvious. We, we know there are ways to regulate protein synthesis that go beyond just how much you know, amino acid there is. But in this case, um, changing the metabolism changes the total amount of protein synthesis. Well, there are definitely many more questions, but um, Jared is around, so um, please engage with him. Uh, another fabulous session, so please let's uh, thank our last speakers. And there are two big choices right now that you have to weigh. Uh, they both start with a B, Bob's or bed. Uh, eventually bed at some point. Um, but before we um, take off for one of the two, uh, I'll pass it over to Janine. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot of announcements. I just want to thank you all for sticking it out and staying around this evening. And the same with our um, uh, remote viewers. We appreciate having all of you. No matter what you choose, don't forget to come back tomorrow morning at um, 9 a.m. because we will resume at that time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.